Hello, my name is Chris Haynes, and today we're going to be looking at hyperconverged infrastructure, uh, specifically looking at getting started with VMware vSAN and why vSAN might be a really particularly useful uh, piece of, it, of, of hyperconverged infrastructure to take a look at. Where did this concept come from? Why are we talking about hyperconverged infrastructure in the first place? Well, demands are shifting. Um, we're seeing a lot of people saying to us that staff are expecting more, that they're expecting things to, to come out to them faster, applications more securely. Um, and also easier to use. So as an IT department, we need to be thinking about how we can revolutionize the, the delivery of these applications. How can we centralize, how can we secure, and how can we effectively protect the infrastructures behind that are moving so quickly? The only way to really do that is to consider some kind of infrastructure that is able to be as dynamic as users are expecting. Um, and this is commonly backed up with uh, what we what we tend to see out, out in the market as our, our three two one approach, which is the idea of three three servers, two switches, and one SAM. Uh, it's a very common approach. It's been used for a very very long time, very successfully. But we're starting to see that turning point now, where end end users are demanding changes so quickly and so dynamically that actually that kind of infrastructure isn't always best suited. And there are key reasons for that as well. Um, so some of the reasons to, to consider hyperconverged infrastructure, certainly some of the things that I've seen, um, a good one on those is taking five weeks to deploy storage. I hear this so much in so many different organizations. Um, that's, an, that's a national statistic, so it might be faster, it might be slower for, for you watching the session today, but it's a, it's a very good, very valid use case when if you consider having to go to a third party provider and ask for specific skills in a storage vendor that you have no, you know, you know nothing about, and saying, look, I want a new storage pool creating. I need it to be X fast. I need it to be filled with, with Y resilience. Um, oh, and by the way, I needed this three weeks ago. So, you know, no pressure. Um, it's very common to, to have those kind of scenarios. Requiring complex outsourced skill sets comes into that same thing. So, you know, the need to go out to market and ask for those to come in and then having to wait for further people's lead times. If you can bring these kind of services in-house, then not only are you saving yourself time, Saving, saving yourself aggro, but also you're speeding up your delivery of services to the end users. 73% of applications are underperforming. So if you think about that, not only are we accepting that we have to wait five weeks to deploy something to a user who demands it now, we're also kind of accepting that three quarters of those apps that go out aren't gonna operate in the way that we want them to. And then there's increased maintenance fees. So should we have to pay more money to more people to help us deliver software and services when the reality is we, we've got a lot of those skills in house. So what does it mean for me? It means you have the ability to accelerate your own IT. It puts you back in control. It allows you to ultimately provision storage on demand and change it on demand to be more fluid, to be more agile, and to naturally evolve towards what's being, being coined the SDDC, the Software Defined Data Center. The reality is hardware has kind of been, it's had its day, it's not fast enough, it's not agile, it's not smooth enough for what we actually need. We need the ability to use software to make hardware better. Um, and that's where Hyperconverged really sits in the marketplace. It's, it's a fantastic tool. If used in the right way, um, it really can change and revolutionize IT in respect of how it's perceived by the business. What we actually now want to do is have a look at what it actually looks like, what it feels like, how easy is it to get set up. It's great talking about all this HCI stuff, but actually, if it's really technical, if it means that I need to relearn a lot of information, then do I really want it in my business? Do I really want it in the school? Um, the reality of it is, it really isn't that difficult. It's, it's infrastructure you're already familiar with. It's licensing you're already familiar with. There's nothing really detailed that has to change other than a change of mindset to adapt the ability to put storage into your existing infrastructure world, into your existing VMware skills. So we'll have a quick look, we'll load up a demo and be right back in a second. And we're now gonna look at how easy it is to actually set up vSAN, because I guarantee you, you will be quite surprised and quite relieved at how easy this application is to actually set up and get working. So we're gonna run through some of the basics. I'm not gonna go into anything too granular at this stage, um, but really give you a bit of a flavor around what, what vSphere and vSAN together, working together can do for you guys. Um, and ultimately show you um, some of the true benefits and some of the reasons why I believe it's certainly a really good use case to consider uh, for anyone who's thinking about dipping their toes in the water a little bit to the hyper-converged infrastructure market. 
Uh, so we're going to host some clusters. I'm going to manage, go down to vSAN and general. You can see the configure button at the top. Yes, it really is this easy. Uh, DDO compression, compression will turn on at this moment in time. We don't need to worry about fault domains or stretch clusters or anything else just for this moment because we're literally just showing you how easy it is to set up. Here are four hosts. Um, each host has got a vSAN node on it with a kernel adapters in. Press next onto that. Just check through. So again, you can see here there's 10 capacity tier flash devices. and We've got two cache tier flash devices on each of the four hosts within the cluster. Uh, we're going to have two disk groups on each host. And each disk group is going to have one flash device for cache and five flash devices for capacity. Now, although we advocate that you should, in reality, for vSAN, consider full flash wherever possible, it's not it's not mandatory, it's, it doesn't require you to uh, to have that. You can actually run with um, cache and capacity. You do need a minimum of one flash disk in any disk group though, so just bear that in mind. Um, but you certainly don't need all flash if, uh, if people are telling you that. Uh, we'll go next on here and finish. Now if we go into disk management, we can review the disks. Into there, we've got six disks in use. Looking at the lower half there, we can see the cache device. Uh, it should be down here, there we go. Uh, cache device in the disk group, which has 372 gig. Now if I just go back to summary, vSAN capacity, there we go. So the total raw capacity of the vSAN data store that we've just provisioned there is 14.56 terabytes, if you can see here. Um, we've got DDoP and compression information on there as well, so we can see that we're getting one times compressed. Um, 160 meg. So reality is we only just turned it on. We wouldn't expect to see a great deal other than that. But we've not provisioned or migrated any virtual machines to it yet either. Um, so we can come back and look at this after we've done some migration. And to do that, it's actually really simple. Uh, so we'll go into storage. We'll have a look at this one. So currently on LAN zero. Um, migrate. All we're going to do is change the storage at this point. Put the default vSAN storage policy. Again, these are just defaults. I'm not configuring anything special at this moment in time. Next, 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 and finish. Now, migrations are happening in the background. If we go back and check the capacity of vSAN. Okay, so these, these VMs will consume 3.57 terabytes. You can see that here. Uh, we've got DDoP and compression applied already, and in this case, we're getting savings of 3.09, which is 2.41 terabytes. So already, we're seeing one great benefit of moving to vSAN on existing disks, which are in your existing servers. Um, so it's certainly worth considering from an efficiency point of view. We can also go in and see a lot of information around the performance data. So if you haven't seen this before, again, part of vSAN includes health and performance. So on here, we're just going to turn the performance service on. Turn on with the defaults. That's now enabled. You can also see the compliance status is compliance. That means that the object is stored on a compliant element of, uh, of the data store. Going to monitor, we've got our IOPS, we've got throughput, we've got latency. We also got congestions and outstanding IO. Now that's on the vSAN, the virtual machine. If we look in the back end infrastructure, we've got the same information as well. Um, we can go as deep as a individual host. So again, looking at the back end, we've got the disk groups in there as well, and we've got the individual disks within each host. We can go another layer higher. So we can go to the virtual machine itself, see the virtual machine consumption, and we can see the virtual disk consumption. And again, we've got all of this information. Uh, if I just scroll down here, you can see the IOPS performing on that individual disk, on that individual VM. Let's go down again. Got the iSCSI throughput and the iSCSI latency. So again, latency is sub one millisecond for the majority of the time there. So quite happy with the performance in that. So this gives you a real understanding of what your infrastructure is doing at all levels. This is information that we haven't, as, as virtualization experts, we don't tend to have this information. This is off to the storage guys, off to the networks team, and all these, all these teams have to come together to get all the best information and paint a, a rounded picture of what's happening in the environment. For the first time we actually can do that within VMware vSphere and within VMware vSAN. Um, so it's another great benefit of going down a, um, a, a hyper-converged infrastructure route. Okay, so we've seen how easy it is to set up VMware vSAN. We've seen how easy it is to allocate our storage, to move virtual machines, 
and to turn on the performance and health checking service so we can actually see individual disks, virtual machines, hosts and clusters. Uh, what we're going to look at here then is creating a new storage policy that defines the number of disks or host failures to tolerate. So one of the problems with going down a vSAN route obviously is where in a traditional 321 architecture that we spoke about in the beginning with two or three servers and a physical SAN is that ultimately we can't define what performance tiers to deliver to certain virtual machines. All we can really do is create aggregates and LUNs and then define the performance based on those LUNs and, and volumes, right? So one of the greater points around putting something like VMware vSAN in place is actually that we can put VM-based storage policies in place. So we've got two default vSAN storage policies. We're not gonna worry about those. We're gonna make a brand new one from scratch. So we'll just go in here and we'll call this our gold tier. So this is gonna have a failure to tolerate of one. Um, We'll have RAID 5, and we'll put two stripes on it. Okay, so we've got our FTT of 1, we're on RAID 5, and we've got two stripes. We'll press next. So as you can see, what I'm looking to do here is set a performance-based tier up. I'll apply this on data services on the vSAN. Our number of failures to tolerate is 1. We said here we we're going to have RAID 5, 6 with erasure coding. And the number of disks, you guessed it, is two. Next. Okay, so straight away from here, we can see what disk groups are compatible and what's incompatible. We proceed to next, finish. Don't know, we're done. So we've created a new storage policy that we're gonna call gold. You've seen everything that's set up within that disk group. If we now go home, back to our clusters, and over to our app 10 virtual machine, we just change the virtual machine storage policy from our default onto gold and change the storage policy to gold, apply to all. That goes through and updates the storage policy on both of those hard disks to gold. So now they are getting the really high performing storage that we just set up. We press OK and we're done. So now without changing anything of any real complexity, I've moved that virtual machine onto a high performing array. We know exactly where everything is. We know exactly how well it's going to perform. And I haven't had to go out and buy new disks or configure new aggregates or bring an external contractor in to help me do stuff. It's just done at an administrator level. So what we'll do now is we'll go into our VM storage policies and we'll just make sure that that's actually applied and it's gone, it's gone away successfully and moved uh, the information on those hard disks onto the right tier. So it hasn't as yet. Um, so we'll just trigger a compliance check. Done, we're now compliant. Excellent. Okay, so something else worth considering here is, um, we looked very, very briefly earlier at the health check service that we enabled. Okay, now I wanna go back to some of that and just give you an idea around what that might have done in the background while we've been looking at other parts of the demo. So go back into our cluster. What we can see here is um, the hardware compatibility is looking like there's an error here. So the controller driver, uh, click onto that and it will give us much more information around what the controller driver is actually doing. Then we can go ahead and actually ask VMware what the issue is. So I'll take us through to VMware and from there we can see that it looks like there's a controller driver that needs to be updated in order to apply and work successfully. So we'll come out of that. Something else that we can do now that we have all this information available to us within vSphere, um, wouldn't it be great if we could just see our capacity, see our free space, see what DDoP and compression is actually doing for us? Um, again, as opposed to using some third party system somewhere with no integration and kind of try and figure it out ourselves. Um, so, capacity overview, DDoP and compression, all is presented in this single pane. Um, we have about 160, I think it was when I last looked, 160 Windows uh, and Linux VMs mixed, uh, mixed environment. Uh, DDoP compression looks like there's around 5 terabytes in use, they're 5.35 ter terabytes of savings. Um, so 7.4 on disk and used is now 2.09. So straight away we can see using vSAN in a server environment like this, this is all flash, so bear that in mind, it just get a better, you do get a better throughput on, um, on all flash than you would on, on traditional SATA or SAS disks. But that being said, DDoP and compression is really, really good um, at getting you some savings. And as you can see there, 3.56 times is actually quite impressive. Um, scroll down here, we can also see the breakdown of how that system is made up. So 62% is virtual disks. We've got 788, 58, 
so 9% of that is DD per compression. Um, so you can go through all of this and we can break down object types and also data types. So primary virtual machine data 3.6 and then the vSAN overhead at 4.59. Now obviously that changes um, depending on what FTTs you set. So how many copies of each data you want, where the witnesses stay, um, how much of that information is going to be used for DD open compression. All of that determines your VSAN overhead. Um, but ultimately, as you can see from the top, our savings still considerably outweigh the uh, the overhead of running VSAN locally anyway. Okay, so another feature of VMware VSAN is proactive tests. So typically before we go ahead and we roll out this infrastructure environment into a live production environment, what we'd look to do is run a couple of tests. So um, storage performance, We'd like to run a test now, we'll run it for 10 minutes, and we'll just run a low stress test. Now don't worry, I'm not going to make you sit there for 10 minutes. I'm literally going to press OK on this, let it run, and then come straight back. Okay, so the system's gone ahead. We're 10 minutes later, we've, um, we've applied the storage performance tests. It's done a low stress test at the bottom, you can see here. Um, and we can see all the IOPS data on the throughput of each individual uh, host with their individual disk groups on each. Really useful information just to make sure that we're getting the right level of throughput that we want. All the disk groups are configured correctly. None of the disks are going to fail having just effectively got them out of the box and put them into the servers. Gives you the peace of mind that actually this system, when it goes into production, that gets some stress, is actually going to be okay. Okay, so one of the most commonly asked things that I, uh, I get referred to when talking about VMware vSAN is what happens when a physical host fails? Fine, I'm gonna lose my virtual machine compute and my memory and my RAM and CPU and everything goes with that. Um, so I'm going to lose some elements of infrastructure, but actually the most important thing to me at this stage is my storage data is now on there. So does that mean that by putting all of this information in one pot, I'm doubling and increasing my risk uh, for when these physical servers fail? Well, actually, no. So one of the most important things to think about is the FTT that you saw me using when we looked at our VM storage policies a little bit earlier. So the FTT stands for failure to tolerate. And when we talk about failure to tolerate, we um, we refer to where a disk group is going to reside, on what physical servers, and in what physical rack, and even on what physical site, if you go as far as a, a metro cluster in a, in a larger environment. Um, but the FTT is really important because you can define where data sits for what VMs, on what physical boxes, in what physical rack. Um, and you'll see what this means. We're going to do a quick test here where I physically pull the power out of one of the units um, and we'll see what happens. So to give an example of the scenario that I'm going to put forward here, uh, we have four physical hosts. If I click on host five, we can see that we've got 10 objects on there. Okay. Now if I click through to app 10, uh, we can see we've got hard disk one and hard disk two two different storage policies on there as well. We've got silver and we've got gold. If I click on that, you can see that it's placed on SMO5. Now, if I switch to our IPMI and power off the server. Okay, panic stations, everything's wrong. We're all broken. What are we gonna do? Um, so host five has physically failed as we can see. We'll refresh this. Uh, clearly there's an issue with host five based on our vCenter alarm notifications. Uh, more importantly though, what we can see here is that app 10 has already been powered up. So app 10 was only down for a few minutes while that host physically turned off and we lost power in this environment. Um, a lot of that is largely down to vSphere HA. But then what vSAN does is, um, because we also have storage on there and we're basing it on the, store, on the silver and gold storage policies, um, when a host goes offline, in order to avoid data loss, it will move and distribute those components across the entire cluster. Um, so just remember that one of the components for App10's hard disks was on host 5. We can actually check the status of those individual components as well. So if we go on to App10, hard disk 1, we can see it's no longer compliant. If we just have a look down here, we can see that um, SMO5 clearly being absent, object not found, is because that host is offline. So the host is offline, but the virtual machine is absolutely fine. And that's the, the whole basis around setting up the FTT properly, making sure that your storage policies are properly configured to make sure that data is in the right place and to effectively predict these kind of outages to make sure that you've always got the right level of resilience built in. Now, the reality of it is, how often does a physical machine fail because of a power cut? Very seldom in my experience. You have multiple power supplies in the back of each unit. You'll have multiple uh, UPSs on the back of those. The reality is, for both power supplies to fail or for both UPSs to fail at the exact same time 
is very, very rare. But if it did, you'd have the FTT to cover you and the virtual machine would probably notice a minute or two minute of downtime if that. If I just switch back and power on the server, give it a little refresh. And we'll see now that our virtual machine is back to healthy. The Silver VM storage policy is now compliant again and SMO5 is back online with our attached disk. Okay, so in vSphere admin world, traditionally you'd be expected to go in and do maintenance mode to patching, evacuate the VMs, uh, get them off the host, do your updates, do your patches, bring the VMs back, everyone goes away happy, no one's none the wiser, right? Problem is, we've put all of our storage onto our physical host now at this stage. So what does that mean for our data? What does it mean for the impact of the business? Well, actually not a lot, to be fair. So we can show you how that would work. Um, maintenance mode, just as you would normally, we'll enter maintenance mode, and you'll actually see down at the bottom here, we've got vSAN data migration as part of an additional option now. Um, so just as you'd expect, we have full data migration, no data migration, or ensure accessibility. Um, they are as easy as they're told. Ensure accessibility means all virtual machines on the host will remain accessible if the host is shut down. Um, bits of data will be moved if needed. Um, the reality is if you've got your FTT set up right, it probably won't need to move any data at all anyway. It will just need to move the deltas in change. Um, full data migration. So vSAN will migrate all data that's on the host. Obviously, this is going to take a long time if you've got a lot of virtual machines and a lot of data. So just bear that in mind. And then no data migration, probably more relevant to test and dev environments than anything else. Um, so we're not really going to worry about that. So we'll leave our option as ensure accessibility and we'll put it into maintenance mode. So that's gone away. Uh, it's going to move those machines over, do the vMotion, get the data off if any is required. In this case, it's not. We're just going to make sure it's accessible. Um, one thing that you can clearly see there is that, I don't know if you, you noticed before, that was 14 terabytes. It's just dropped down to 11. So the physical host has come out of the cluster. It's in maintenance mode. Um, and what that means is that we've lost some of our storage available to be allocated. So again, just bear that in mind um, as, we, uh, as we start doing our maintenance. It will have an impact on your storage. But the reality of it is, that allocation has already been made when we did our FTT calculations at the beginning. So it's not necessarily an issue and it's, it's the reality is it's planned for. Uh, I go now onto here and I exit our maintenance mode. The host file will come back online. We can check the raw capacity again. You can see there that it jumps back up to 14.56. The idea behind this is that vSAN's maintenance mode will simplify this task. That's, that's really the idea. We don't want it to be complicated. It wants to be a really easy, simple product that goes the, the, the a VMware admin can walk in, press maintenance mode, evacuate the VMs, evacuate the data, leave the data on that's, that's not necessarily at risk, and then shut down that host or make it make amendments and changes, bringing it back on a bit later on with very little impact to the environment. Now, there are a whole array of other things that we can talk around around resilience, which I'm not really going to focus on today, um, ultimately, ultimately, because each environment at this stage might be a little bit more specific than the last, and it might be that you have multiple sites, you have multiple locations within one site, you have multiple racks, multiple servers. Um, all of these things will have a, a bearing on what reality we can show you around how we configure that FTT. Um, there's also something, something called a fault domain. Now, um, the idea around a fault domain is that uh, if you have multiple racks within one room, and you wanted to isolate those racks. So if there was a single rack fire or failure, um, you'd have more resilience in another rack. Now that can be really good if you want to distribute your risk over, over multiple racks. Um, that same logic applies to multiple sites. So you could have multiple fault domains at one site, multiple fault domains at another site. Um, specifically, you could look at linking that in with the likes of VMware Cloud and VMware on AWS. So you could have a fault domain in AWS so you've not got uh, all of your data, all of your SANS and storage information sat on one specific host in one specific data center. So it was kind of built with this cloud available model that uh, that everyone's talking about today. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail around that, um, but all of that's available within vSAN default anyway. So worth looking into at a later stage and I can give you more personalized demos if you want to have a look at that. What I would like to talk about though is vRealize Operations Manager. So definitely worth considering here. Um, gives us a much more comprehensive idea of what's going on within the environment. Some of you will already have vRealize Operations Manager. If not, it's worth just checking with your account manager if you if you can get it as a bolt-on. 
Um, specifically, if you're considering vSAN as an option, definitely have a look at exploring this. All of this information is gathered with, from every virtual machine, from every disk. Um, we've got latency information on all of the individual disks. As you can see there, the latency from the top is dramatically different from the latency at the bottom. So you can see clearly um, 5746 have got the flash disks in them. Um, the other servers have got the, uh, the slower SATA disks within them. Just scroll down here as well. We can see the virtual SAN data store throughput um, and the capacity used. So all of this information can be customized and entirely built around what it is that you're looking for. Uh, again, this is these are all little dashboards that we've configured earlier. Um, magnetic disk capacity used, disk errors, where are indicators and SSD errors. We can look through all of this to make sure that the entire environment is performing as it should. Um, we've also got things like entity usage. This is one that we created to look at networks and latency. Um, we've got troubleshooting. So this is more of a graphical one. Um, gives you an idea around exactly where your errors are. In this case, we've got a magnetic disk in degraded. If I click on that. So two out of 11 descendant host adapters have symptoms vSAN component states on the disk change to degraded state. So it looks like this might be suggesting that there's an issue with the host adapter or controller. Expand the second issue there. Yeah, so clearly we can see there's multiple disks affected in this, in this particular problem. Maybe it's hardware, firmware, maybe a driver issue, something like that. But the idea behind all of this is that drilling down through all of these individual errors, all of these individual notifications, allows us to make a much quicker evaluated view of where the problem is, if there's a problem at all, and more often than not, if that problem can be fixed through um, triaged information from all VMware customers, which is all brought together as well. Um, so hopefully that's been that's been really good. That's a, a very quick whistle-stop tour of VMware vSAN. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and if there are any questions at all, uh, I'd certainly welcome your feedback and thank you very much for your time.